Hello everyone, good evening, hello, dear. Um, a very warm well welcome of course also from me. I'm Birge, I'm a legal customer success manager at FIDAS and very happy to meet you all here today um, with some of you we already chatted. And now I would like to greet our dearest host, friend, customer and guest at the same time of this evening. Uh, welcome, Birge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, before we start talking about structures, I would um, honestly like to hear a little bit about you. You uh, entered your profession working in great law firms, and afterwards you decided to switch into in-house legal counsel. How did this happen and why? Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about your motivation? Yeah, sure I can. I, I don't think that the story is so unique, to be honest, <laughs> uh, in, a, in a group of in-house counsels. So I, I started my career at Linklater, moved to um, a lovely international law firm with the very easy to pronounce name Nur Stiefenhofer Lutz, <laughs> um, that then decided to rebrand into Nur because that was the easiest of the three to pronounce, still impossible and I worked in their New York office. Um, they had a small office in um, New York, representative office, this is where we met, but also met Janis there, so it's a whole New York Nura gang uh, here in the room today. Um, that was pretty, my, pretty much my law firm career. So I finished my law firm career after roughly eight years at Nura, and then I went in-house uh, with a company called Bombardier Transportation, doing M&A, uh, now part of Alstom. Um, from that, I started my big journey into consulting. Uh, I started working for BCG as part of uh, the team at BCG Digital Ventures, so very firmly integrated into the Berlin startup environment. And from there, after roughly three years, uh, I joined Simon Kucher, Simon Kutcher, Simon <laughs> Kure, whatever you, whatever you want, um, as the first lawyer and the general counsel and head of compliance. So Simon Kucher is roughly 30 something years old, I can't do the math right now, but they never really bothered having the in-house legal team. Mm -hmm. As a consultant that is driven by revenue and, and incentivized by revenue and, and sort of looks at what can I take out of the company, you don't necessarily need more fee burners, uh, I'll use the, the term mm -hmm. one last time today. Um, so they try to leverage mostly outside resources for a very, very long time, probably too long to be honest. But the firm was also at a size which was firmly under the radar in almost all jurisdictions we're in. Uh, we are 2,200 employees globally, half a billion revenue. So it's not that small, but in the big consulting world, we are tiny as compared to the, the big three, the MBBs, uh, McKinsey, Bain, uh, BCG. Um, and so since two years now, we're building up this legal team. Mm -hmm. uh, we are seven. Uh, today, we will be nine, hopefully, in a couple of months. Uh, so we're steadily growing. That's what everybody feared when they hired me. That <laughs> soon there were 40 or more lawyers running around. Probably not going to happen. Um, but yeah, that's the story of how I got here. Great, good to know. And um, still, of course, as you said, um, Simon Kuhle is a big name and after it's a big consulting firm. So how is the group structure indeed? How are you implemented in the different jurisdictions mm -hmm. and how many jurisdictions are concerned? Yeah, uh, that's why we need this. Uh, it's no longer on the screen, but um, also very honest, we're very much driven by uh, having operational companies in every country we operate in. And we are present in roughly 40, 42 countries mm -hmm. and we have close to 40 entities. We're not always represented by a full entity but that's kind of the setup. We have three independent sister companies sitting on top, the German holding GmbH being the key holding, um, and then these 40 entities uh, underneath. Usually two managing directors or more, depending on jurisdiction, you have a board and all types of other functions. So that's why we desperately needed to move out of the good old server drive <laughs> where documents were stored into something that is actually uh, usable. And all the structure is held by shareholders who are yeah. partners. And how yeah. is that range? How many partners do you approximately yeah, have? Typical structure for a professional services mm -hmm. company. Uh, our partners uh, hold or own the holding companies on top. Uh, it's close to 200 now this year. Uh, that's the next complexity we have to manage. So we have a rather large cap table of uh, 200 people 
being invested in this company. And that's also the uh, demographic we deal with and that we have to provide information to. So anything that is centralized and easy to access is really helpful. So how do you manage the decision-making process with that scale of range? Um, question should be, do we manage the decision-making <laughs> process? Um, no, we, we do have a, a decently defined governance that uh, we are improving as we speak. Um, so we have two CEOs, we have a board, we have uh, something we call executive committee, and then we have uh, country managing directors. And um, in the end, the strongest wins. Okay. okay. <laughs> So um, you don't really gather together all the 200 partners, or how does it? It work? happens uh, usually twice a year. Still, uh, to be quite frank, uh, board meets every month, either virtually or in person. Um, so every quarter is an in-person meeting. Um, every month there's a call. The partners meet twice in various locations. Um, next time, I think in April in Frankfurt, mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously a key event for us to to manage as a legal team. Um, preparing decisions, having votes, convincing consulting partners that coming together as partners, talking is not necessarily sufficient to have a proper binding corporate decision. Um, so yeah, a lot of educational work also. Um, the company has grown organically. That means that the skill level of a partner is relatively high, but it's all homegrown. Mm -hmm. So they're used to what they've been doing for 30 years. And so we try to bring in a little bit more compliance, a little bit more transparency, and yeah, that's our journey here. Truly, shouts out for digitization, <laughs> for yeah. education and uh, decision making. And that's uh, actually what you're doing. So I had known that among my questions, how did you find the legal department? You already answered there was none. And um, what were the biggest obstacles in building up one? And do you work centrally out of this legal department of seven, you just mm -hmm. said, uh, for all of this global group? I think the complexity was more where to start because when you, there was never a legal team, there's nothing there, which is a, a blessing and a curse. Um, because sometimes it gets so frustrating that you have open loops everywhere that you don't know where to start. On the other hand, that puts us in a position to, instead of fixing an old legacy system or structure, just purchase a tool and just get going. Um, I think the biggest challenge, quite frankly, is to build a culture and to find the right talent that can deal with the lack of structure mm -hmm. and has a desire to also build and create. And um, that is rewarding and sometimes frustrating, as Julia can, can tell. Um, so um, that's, that's pretty much how we operate. The team is spread across the globe. We targeted our biggest markets. The first hire was actually, and I mentioned this today to someone already, was actually a former consultant that runs legal operations for us because we knew that everything that we do is a project mm -hmm. um, because there's nothing there. Uh, so that was the first hire um, to also define our strategy, to implement certain uh, rules that I had learned at BCG of being very user-centric, understanding who you deal with and who you work for and what the solution needs to look like. Um, and then finding the right talent in the markets that mattered most based by risk or size. And so we started in the US um, with our build up with the US counsel, Darren, who's in my team. Then uh, we added London, we added Germany. Um, we now have a team member in Zurich, uh, one in Frankfurt, which is still Germany, I'm told. <laughs> um, kidding. Um, and we are adding uh, more colleagues here actually in Berlin because we also believe that it, there is a value in having a team. So it's not only your shareholders and stakeholders who cooperate internationally, it's already the legal team also yeah. who's situated in different countries. That's quite interesting. Uh, and leads to my next question. So how is the stage of digitization? What's for you valuable and good digitization? But obviously you need to communicate somehow and um, do yeah. process governance. Yeah, to be honest, we are digitization or any type of transformational work sometimes sounds very large, but it's actually kind of small steps we're taking. Mm -hmm. um, just the mere fact when we started here, I mean, I'm not sure how well you know the consulting industry, but in the consulting industry, outside of consultants, nobody matters really. So mm -hmm. th the rest is just, you need to have a finance team um, to get paid, but that's <laughs> really everything. 
Um, so what I'm saying is we introduced, for instance, that the legal team sends out partner newsletters and newsletters to the entire company, which was unheard of. But it was crucial for us because we understood whatever change we want to bring, whatever we want to achieve, only goes through education. Uh, so we established a channel and now we are playing with tools like um, AI-based tools to actually generate content because we're seven people, we're not copywriters, and so we have to leverage some technology to really get the word out. And mm -hmm. it's not so much that we don't know what to say, it's more we don't have the capacity to get the volume out of our team, so mm -hmm. we leverage technology for that. Um, we leverage technology where it makes sense to just centralize access to data. Mm -hmm. uh, 187 partners previously had a single person sitting in Bonn, which is our foundation office, um, and that person um, did nothing but responding to partner requests all day for um, uh, commercial register excerpts, how many shares do I own, can I transfer my shares from A to B, um, what's next on the board agenda. So that we tried to eliminate because mm -hmm. the finance team who had that person gladly wanted to shift that task to the legal team. <laughs> I don't know why. And we said we gladly take it, but only if we establish a different system of managing information. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we, what we approach. So while we look into the big topics like AI review and all this type of stuff, we also acknowledge that we are at a stage of maturity within our team, a scale of the company overall, but also those big ticket items sometimes are more marketing than reality. So we try mm -hmm. to focus on what's achievable, also to produce some output that the business can see, touch, feel, and, and kind of continue to fund us on our big journey, <laughs> um, which is crucial. Which is crucial, of course. Yeah. I mean, all are variable questions that need to be answered. <laughs> of course, you need the staff to do so and the capacity. So, uh, which leads to my next question again. So, what kind of tools do you already apply and use in your legal team? Uh, we use Fides, which is a surprise. <laughs> um, otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, we, we do use tools that I think a lot of us have and know. We use a digital whistleblower channel. Um, we use um, uh, digital communication tools, as I said, we use uh, Thinthesia, some of us may know it, it's an uh, AI-based video creation tool to, to get mm -hmm. content produced and out. Uh, we started working with agencies, we uh, blew uh, loads, uh, big parts of our budget on agencies and we said we have to stop that. Um, and we do um, certain parts of compliance management uh, with software, so one trust, a lot of us know it, that we use. And how do you proceed when you want to introduce a new legal tech tool, for example? We usually, and that's what I mentioned, and I don't want to bore anybody, but we really start with a very consultancy-driven um, stakeholder analysis and persona analysis, like who do we work with, who do we cater for? And I'll make this very concrete uh, with the example of Fides. I think we use Fides for six or so months now, close to a year, feels like. Mm -hmm. um, that's correct. None of our partners has ever seen the tool. And that's not because the tool is bad, it's by design, because we understand that before we have not all the information 100% correct, we figured out certain issues of how to best give access to partners, what rights they should receive, um, what we want to do with the tool, how to communicate that. We will not allow a single partner on that platform because we understand the moment we let them on the platform and it's not ready, we've lost them. They look at it, they look for some information, say it's not here, I hate this and then the system is dead. And so we did this analysis and we leveraged the tool for us as a team, we leveraged it for other support functions, finance and so on, and we slowly but surely are now ready, hopefully next week, to actually allow all the 200 partners access to the tool by actually executing our first resolution, our US resolution, um, because we figured Creating a DocuSign document manually for 200 people takes close to an hour alone to drag signature fields onto a file, which is insanity. So we will not do that. I was done the years prior, so we will not continue that. Um, and that's kind of the approach we take. So we're really careful in analyzing who do we work for and what does that person need to know or need to see or need to experience before we launch something. 
because you're so great in explaining that, what do you think are the major <laughs> advantages of using feeders? For example, you don't have to drag DocuSign um, signature fields because feeders does this yeah, automatically. That's more, that's more our, <laughs> our problem. I think the, the biggest, um, biggest relief for us will be that single email or chat-based requests for information will end. That's kind of the biggest thing that we'd like to achieve. Mm -hmm. and that it becomes very clear that corporate governance is not something that we talk about, but we actually live. And that's also what the tool is useful for. And what I mentioned in terms of partners are not willing to adjust to defined workflows or processes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are, because you have to force them into it. And you have to make them understand that being a shareholder means using this tool to execute resolutions. And no, you cannot call me to cast your vote. That's not possible. So that's kind of the educational process we're on. Um, and that's what we will leverage feeders for. So of course, a field where we will support you. Um, but besides of all that topics, mm -hmm. what do you think are still the biggest challenges in your day-to-day -day work? And if you just had a magical wand, yeah. what would be the next tool that you would create? Where do you think are still the difficulties and the problems and the challenges for your work? It's a good one. There are uh, loads of challenges and questions. I think the next big thing for us is actually improving how information is available because already with our team at this rather young stage, we have so many pieces of information, knowledge that we would love to share with the partnership. But we also understand that quite sadly, they really don't care about legal stuff <laughs> unless they need it. So solving that puzzle of making information available exactly at the moment when somebody needs it will be one of our big next challenges mm -hmm. and that's the world of the infamous chatbot uh, hopefully mm -hmm. that will help us tremendously with achieving that goal that we only have to send a consultant or partner to a single entry field where they can ask their question and they will magically find the information um, that for me is one of the biggest challenges. And then there's things like contract review and all that type of fun stuff, but that really will help us tremendously because in the end, we are not at the client, we are not in the field, we're not seeing what's going on in an office. That's the consultant, that's the partner. So the smarter they are, the better informed they are, the more secure our company is. So that's. We didn't rehearse it, but still a great answer for us here because that's also something we're currently working on. As you know, chat with your documents so you will be able to ask questions within feeders and get your answers and also your partners will do the same. Um, so that would be maybe the final topic for mm -hmm. my questions today. How do you feel about AI in this context? Do you think it has more chances or more risks and how do you foresee the evolution of AI within the next couple of years? I'm certainly not the expert, so happy for anybody to pitch in. Um, but a couple of honest truth. Um, AI is so hot right now that even a company of our size, which is sizable but not very large, has trouble really accessing certain solutions. Uh, we reached out to vendors to understand AI review capabilities, and out of the 15, two responded. That's kind of the state of the market, right? Because they're completely saturated. They can't, they, they don't know they have wait lists for clients. I think we discussed this for law firms as well. Um, so that's one of the, the challenges or the truth of AI is it's really hard to get access to good things because they're so thought after. The next challenge I feel is that if you really look deeply into what's existing on the market, things are not that great. Just an example, I'm still very close to the legal team at BCG. The BCG legal team leverages iCertus as their CLM solution and they are even iCertus preferred partners. And they try to build a NDA review module. So really basic contract type, really simple task, and mm -hmm. two high stake companies working together. They didn't switch it on because it was so bad. So they tested it and they realized that their nearshoring center in India is a lot faster than reviewing NDAs <laughs> with less mistakes than the tool at this stage. I'm not saying this is going to be true in a year from now, but mm -hmm. at this stage, they didn't switch it on. So that's another big challenge for me, for AI. But for us as a very small team with very few people where you don't have challenges of managing people out or really having dramatic transformations in your own team, this is a huge opportunity for us. So we're definitely looking into this. It's just hard to have access at this point. 
and also sometimes the functionality is not what's promised in flashy videos, no offense. Um, <laughs> the, the other people's flashy videos, I mean. Um, so that's, that's a bit of a challenge, uh, quite frankly, at this point. So that, what do you think, I mean, the answer is already hidden in this answer, <laughs> but what do you think will be left over for us human lawyers to review and to correct? So what do you think will be the main work for us then? I think, and that's not my quote, we just had a call today with our marketing team and marketing is another big area where AI has a massive uh, effect on copywriting and, and creating content, changing one piece of content into 15 formats. Mm -hmm. and, and what our head of marketing basically said today is, not a single marketer in my team will lose their job, but they will be so much more efficient. And I guess that is, at least for the short to mid term, I think the truth that these tools will be efficiency enhancing, but not necessarily killing all of our jobs immediately. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Did you have changes in staff after uh, the introduction of feeders, for example? So how do you make the responsibilities? No, we, we, we didn't have any changes. So we planned for this. We had uh, a paralegal hire to manage these entities for us. And mm -hmm. the reason that we, we have 40 entities, as I said, uh, we have 200 partners. One person managing this globally is completely understaffed, quite frankly. It is no longer because we now have a tool that helps us. Mm -hmm. It's still hard sometimes for her, but at least the tool helps her tremendously to get closer to being able to do this on her own. And we cooperate closely, so greetings no, true. to your <laughs> dearest paralegal, who is a very yeah. pleasant person to work with. Um, well, um, that would be all of my questions on my list. Do you have something on your heart that you would like to add? <laughs> we don't know each other well enough in this group to, uh, for me to share. No, all good. Thank you so much for Fides, uh, for, for getting this event together. Um, thank you to the partners at Simon Kucha for allowing us to use that space. And so, yeah. Also great thanks from us uh, to you and of course to them all. And um, with that, I would like to thank you again for your very interesting insight and input. Um, open the round for questions. So, uh